Hello everyone, this is William Gentry, and this is the Riparian and Wetland Ecosystems class for Rangeland Principles at the University of Idaho. The first thing we need to do is differentiate between uplands, riparian areas, and wetlands. The stream channel is the area where the water is actively, actively moving through, such as a creek, a stream, or a river. The areas of land uh, adjacent to that are called riparian areas, or riparian zones as they listed on this graphic. And then everything in higher elevation from that, uh, where the riparian vegetation is not present and the amount of moisture in the soil is not as high, those are considered uplands. Uplands are those drier areas that only maintain a lot of moisture in their soil immediately after precipitation events. Riparian areas are those areas adjacent to bodies of water that have higher vegetation levels than the areas around it. They're often at a lower elevation, and they are very important for maintaining stream health, which we'll cover later. Here you have the two different types of riparian zones, one being lodic, which are associated with moving streams and waters, and the other is lentic, which is more of your still water, um, kind of like marshes and emergent wetlands. So wetlands are areas with hydric soils that are permanently or seasonally saturated by water. Healthy riparian areas are those areas that have lots of vegetation with good root mass that helps protect and stabilize the banks. Um, this allows the stream to remain uh, sinuous and make sure it doesn't have a straight shoot through an area. Um, it has elevated saturation zones which not only increase subsurface storage of water, but also allows for filtration and a buffer for um, fertilizers and stuff that might make their way from farmlands. They have increased summer stream flow, which um, helps with keeping water cooler in summer, and it also helps with keeping water warmer and less icy in the winter. Um, this all uh, makes it so that the habitat is much improved for not just the fish and the aquatic organisms in the water, but also the wildlife that lives in the, in the land also. And this is a good example of what a healthy stream riparian area looks like. So degraded riparian areas, in contrast, have little vegetation to protect and stabilize banks, which um, causes a decrease in sinuosity over time, lowered saturation zones of water, um, lower stream flow in summer, uh, warmer water in summer, icy in winter, and this overall creates poor habitat for both fish and terrestrial wildlife. Um, this obviously is a, a pretty good example of what a degraded uh, riparian and stream system looks like. Riparian plants are important for controlling stream systems even though they're often overlooked and large woody debris and rocks or boulders are usually considered first for the job but plants have been shown to mold streams and the way they flow. This graph demonstrates the significant amount of root mass and length that are associated with these riparian plants and how they compare to things such as Nevada bluegrass down there. You're going to see it's significant. And this graph here shows how that root length and mass can really come together to make uh, channel stability and help improve in that sinuosity of those creeks I was talking about earlier. Um, you can see how much higher some of these uh, rate as far as channel stability ratings go than others. You can see that anchored rock up there in red, but you can also look down there at Willow Sedge, um, Beaked Sedge, Baltic Rush, they have extremely high channel stability ratings. So that's why we said that they're underrated, but um, people should definitely consider them more for the task. In this slide, you can see just how serious those Baltic Rush roots are. And you can tell by looking at that, that that the bank on the side of that stream is going to be held together extremely well as long as you can keep the ball of the crush um, thriving. The other aspect about um, keeping streams healthy and happy is the wildlife portion too. Not only do you need 
a healthy riparian area, but you also need animals that help maintain these wetlands and these riparian areas and make sure that they stay healthy. So watch this video about beavers and learn about why they're important to the ecosystems that they help construct. They're one of the largest rodents in the world. They're indisputably adorable, and hey, Canada doesn't put just anyone on their money. But the main reason you should appreciate beavers is that they're second only to us in their ability to completely transform the environments they live in. Usually for the better, though. While we like to surround ourselves with warehouse stores and hamburger restaurants, beavers will turn a stream-fed meadow, even a patch of desert, into a lush, watery habitat for all sorts of wildlife, aquatic, and lamb lubber alike. They do it, of course, by building dams, and darn can these guys dam. Most beaver dams are 5 to 10 meters long and form small ponds behind them, but sometimes these structures have been known to turn into decades-long development projects. The biggest beaver dam in the world, in Canada's wood Buffalo National Park is more than 850 meters long, forming a huge wetland that's actually been photographed from space. It's been under construction since the 1970s, with subsequent generations of beavers adding to it, and it's getting bigger every year. Beavers go through all the trouble of dam building primarily for defense. Some build lodges made of sticks and mud in the ponds that they create, while others burrow into their muddy banks. Both are designed to be entered only underwater. By surrounding themselves with deep water, beavers can protect their dens from predators like wolves and wildcats while creating a habitat that supports the aquatic plants that they like most, like cattails, willows, pondweed, and aspen. The dams are usually started by single males trying to attract a mate or a young couple which pair up for life. Adorable beaver love. But one thing that's a little less cute is how completely serious these guys can be about their dams. Scientists call it instinctive behavior, but it can end up looking kind of compulsive. Biologists believe that the sound of running water actually actually triggers dam building behavior in beavers. Some theorize that beavers may even be able to feel or otherwise sense in the water when a leak has sprung in a dam. Research has shown that little gaps intentionally created in beaver dams will cause every member of a colony to drop everything to repair it regardless of what else needs to be done. Scientists a little evil, have even played audio recordings of running water near beaver sites and have returned in the morning to find speakers covered with sticks and mud. This obsessive engineering is all made possible by beavers' trademark teeth. And you may have heard that their teeth continue to grow throughout their lifetimes, which is true, but only their big curved front incisors. Beavers' voluminous tree gnawing keeps their teeth from growing too long, but they don't actually eat through trees, they actually prefer to feast on non-woody plants like water lilies and cattails in the spring. In the winter, they strip trees of their bark and eat the soft layer of tissue underneath known as cambium. And despite what the cartoons have taught us, beavers' famous front teeth are not white, they're orange because their tooth enamel contains iron, which makes them incredibly strong and sharp, even though it makes them look like they have a two-pack-a-day habit. And finally, a note about beaver butts. They smell delightful. Both male and female beavers have a pair of anal scent glands that they use to mark their territory, and the yellowish oil that they produce, called castoreum, smells precisely like sweetened vanilla. So much so that for hundreds of years it was used to flavor food and drinks, and in some places can still be found in perfumes and processed foods under the ambiguous moniker of natural flavoring. Other cultures have prized castoreum for its medicinal properties, and that might be because one of beavers' favorite snacks is the bark of willow trees, which contains the chemical salicin, which people have used for centuries to make natural painkillers. But because beavers eat so much of the bark, their sweet-smelling butt oils can be chock full of salicylic acid, which is the precursor compound to aspirin. Now what other animal can you think of that makes its habitat more livable, drops everything to keep its neighborhood safe, and has a bum that smells like dessert?